moving right on, uh, you know, one of the most important things to think about from day one is diversity and inclusion. If you wait too long to try to fix a broken culture or a diverse culture, uh, it's too late. Um, and so I'd like to introduce uh, our next moderator who's going to run a panel, which is Sasha Thompson. So please come on up here. Round of applause for uh, Sasha. <laughs> do you want to do an introduction on the program? And Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, my name is Sasha Thompson. I am the inclusion marketing lead for Amazon Web Services, and I manage a program called We Power Tech. And the purpose of the program is really twofold. One is to make sure that we um, have a diverse pool of technologists, AWS technologists, in the industry. So we're not just focused on AWS or Amazon, but making sure that we provide services to all companies that leverage the AWS platform. And so we do this working with organizations that serve K-12 through working professionals. The second part of that is to provide a platform for individuals from underrepresented groups to speak on stage, to tell their stories. And so we partner with the startups team to do things like this, um, and as well as other organizations to provide platforms for, for individuals from underrepresented groups. And so today we are going to have two people um, come up. The first one is Beth Ferreira, and the other one is Dr. Nashley Cephas. And so they're gonna talk a little bit about um, building inclusion into your startup from the very beginning. So thank you, Beth. Thank you. Is it on now? Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I think we'll first start by introducing ourselves. Um, I'm Beth Ferreira. I'm a partner at a fund here in New York called First Mark Capital. Uh, we have 1.6 billion under management. We invest in early stage companies, uh, generally seed and series A, um, focus both on the enterprise and consumer companies. And I'll let Ashley introduce herself. Thank you. So, as they mentioned, uh, I'm actually an Amazon employee, uh, originally from Jackson, Mississippi. I uh, went to undergrad at Mississippi State University in computer engineering. Got my PhD and master's in electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, that is where I started working with a young lady named Jewel Burks, who uh, was the CEO and founder of PartPick, which is a startup company that allows you to take a picture of a part with a penny next to the part. We would measure the part and tell you what the part was and a link to where you can buy the part. Um, so during this time, I came on as CTO for Part Pick uh, back in 2015 after we raised enough funding. Uh, we were able to sell the company to Amazon in November of 2016. Uh, so now I'm a manager at Amazon and our entire team is now um, in an Atlanta office uh, with Amazon. So you were really early at Park Pick. Can you talk to us a little bit about your organization and how it got started? Right, so Jewel Burks, uh, just was C CEO, she started working at a parts company uh, called McMaster Car in Atlanta, Georgia. It's a big parts warehouse, and she was working as customer service uh, manager. People would call in all the time and say, hey, I need this thingamabob, I need this doohickey. Um, it looks round on this end, and on the other end, it has this little thing. It's about two inches in length. So of course, you know, this happens all the time with parts companies. People are not getting the right parts. You often have to resend the part because you sent them the wrong part. So she had the great idea. She said, you know, I'm tired of being cursed out on the phone because I can't get it right. I just really want you to take a picture. That way, I'll get it right. And so that's how the idea came about. She wasn't necessarily a technical person, and so she needed someone to kind of build it out, the prototype for her, and that's where I came in. Uh, she actually, it was random. Someone, she met someone at Georgia Tech. She didn't go there, she just ran into someone and they introduced her to me, uh, which that was my, my background, machine learning, image recognition. Um, and so I was able to help her build the prototype, which they were able to take and raise $1.5 million. Um, if you know, funding and raising money is very difficult, especially 
uh, a minority-owned uh, black female as CEO and CTO. Uh, so our COO was also a, a black male, um, <clears throat> Jason Crane. And so um, Jewel actually was a graduate of Howard University. Uh, Jason Crane was a graduate of Morehouse. And so uh, we were able to raise that much, much money. We brought on a team of about 10 people over the, pat over the course of two, two and a half, three years um, before we were acquired. So that's how it all started. So let's spend a moment on that topic. So in case you, I don't know if many of you know this statistic, but according to Digital Undivide in their recent report, Project Diane, only 4% of women-led startups, um, excuse me, sorry, 4% of women-led startups were run by black women. So when you think about 2% of the funding went to women and then 4% of that went to black women. Um, with the average amount raised of $42,000, and you were able to raise $1.5 million. Can you talk about that journey, the, some of the challenges, how that, how, how that kind of came about? Uh, certainly, so uh, of course there's lots of challenges. I think, uh, I mentioned Jewel wasn't a technical person, so there was no prototype, it was only an idea. Uh, she found it very difficult to raise money with just an idea. Um, but how do you build a prototype if you have no money to build it? Well, that's where you find someone who can work with you and kind of help you bootstrap until you can get there. And that's kind of what our situation was. So it was very difficult um, until we could actually show and prove, a lot of showing and proving. That was a reoccurring theme throughout the entire time of raising money. Uh, we also, by us being located in Atlanta, uh, a lot of people was, why don't you move to New York? Why don't you move to Silicon Valley? You know, that's where all the money is. That's where you should be. Uh, but we really believed in the Southeast area. We believe we have smart people there as well. And so, uh, especially with the pipeline of technical talent coming from Georgia Tech um, and Atlanta being a huge uh, startup hub in the Southeast now, uh, we wanted to stay there. And plus our customer base was there, all the parts companies, lots of parts warehouses. Um, we decided that that was where we wanted to stay. and so. We, we had to try to find investors who were okay with that, and that was another struggle. So I think, lastly, with us building this technology, um, this is the, the field of computer vision or machine learning, if you're not familiar with it, and it's very primitive. There's a lot that can be done that hasn't been done yet. It's a lot of research involved, and so it wasn't just like a cut and dry, I need to hire people to build this. You know, bada bing, bada boom, we got the product. No, it, it took a lot of engineering talent to come up with the solutions to these hard technical problems. And so that was another challenge there. So the entrepreneur dilemma, right? So you have your the challenge of raising capital on one hand, and now you're still building your business on the other. So in the earliest stages, can you talk about some of the challenges that you faced and how you overcame them? Right, so hiring, of course, is a, is a, is a big topic. Uh, especially when you're trying to build an entire uh, research team. Uh, you know, just hiring start at startups in general is, is something that can be challenging because you're essentially trying to convince someone who's a superstar at this big company, hey, come over to us. Um, we're starting with pretty much nothing. Um, I can guarantee you some equity if we end up selling the company and being successful. Uh, you're probably not going to get pay the salary you're getting now. You know, how do you convince someone to come over? It was even a, a challenge for me somewhat because right after grad school, um, before Park Peak was able to raise the money, I actually took a position here in New York um, at a consulting firm. And all the while, I'm just kind of, you know, I don't know, do I really want to do the startup thing? You know, I'm, I've been a poor grad student for so long. I just kind of like making money and just, you know, being at a consulting firm. but. I really believed in what she was doing, and so I, I ultimately decided to pack up everything and move back to Atlanta from New York. But you know, it's a very challenging decision, especially if you're, you know, have a family and you're looking for something more stable. Uh, so, so we were able to finally find some people uh, who wanted to take a chance on us, and we're so glad. And they're they're so glad they did as well. Um, but I think it literally it paid off. So, any advice on convincing those early hires? You really have to be persistent, um, and, and really like the perks. Really, you know, they may seem small, but like free free chips and drinks and uh, free lunch. Uh, we actually had a, a no vacation, uh, unlimited, unlimited vacation yeah. policy, and so even though we, we hardly ever took vacation because we were working so hard, but 
uh, those little things I think add up and you know if you convince them that you know I'm offering you something you probably won't get here uh, in the end if it all kind of pays off not in terms of salary necessarily but you can make it all pay off um, you know in other ways and so I think that was a good way to help convince people so you, the makeup of your company is pretty diverse was that was that purposeful or organic I think I think a little bit of both so Given all the hiring struggles, you, you're really only going to get the people who ultimately say, yes, I want to take a chance on you. So you can't be as strategic as if we were like a huge company with lots of benefits to offer. So I think ultimately we wanted to target people uh, with very diverse background, men, women, uh, you know, female, all types of different ethnicities. And we, we left no stone unturned, so we, you know, we, we checked uh, the local schools, uh, Georgia Tech. Um, we all reached out to our own networks. We made sure that um, a lot of the hiring was actually done through word of mouth and people who referred people to us and people that we could trust. Um, I've also fired a lot of people, uh, so you know, we've made some mistakes in hiring. We thought maybe this was a good decision, but it wasn't. Uh, but you've, you've all heard the you know, hire, hire slow, fire fast, and so, uh, we did definitely a lot of that, but I think, um, yeah, I think, yeah. So. Yeah, that's super important. So sitting in my seat, I get a lot of, uh, we love to have more women or we love to have more diversity, but we just can't find qualified candidates. Um, we all know that that's not true. Um, how do you, <laughs> any advice for those people? Yes, yeah, so uh, call up your local uh, diversity representative at uh, all the top schools, at all the top companies, uh, word of mouth, they're, they're out there. Um, they're hard, they may be hard to find. I think it's more so an issue of are the standards higher for them when they interview? That's, that's a whole nother story, but. Yeah, keeping it unbiased, right? right. Exactly, that's, I think that's the bigger problem, but they're definitely out there, you know. Absolutely. I think there's a couple things. Like one is just making sure that that funnel is really big. And so, like you said, sort of cast that net as wide. Right. But then the other piece is how do you, how do you get bias out of the, mm -hmm. out of the process? Um, so you're in a really unique position as CTO. Um, tell us a little bit about that experience in building a technical team, um, you know, as a woman, as a minority, and it, what was that experience, particularly in a in a market that's uh, not one considered one of the main markets? Right. So, uh, first of all, by me being the the first quote unquote technical person at the company, I had to sort of convince uh, you know my business counterparts, uh, you know, Jewel, you know, this is engineering, and it takes a long time to develop these solutions. Um, you know, we win some, we lose some. That's just how research goes. And so trying to convince them that, you know, th this is normal for any, you know, tech startup, whereas they were probably thinking, okay, we got a list, let's get the list done and move on to the next thing. It was not a, you may not always be able to figure it out. So uh, I think that was one thing that was kind of unique. And also, uh, you know, I am a female uh, and I'm trying to hire engineers. All of our engineers were actually male. Um, and on my current team, I have six guys who report to me, um, six engineers, but I think, you know, it's been a very interesting experience because uh, as, a, as a manager, I've learned that, you know, you have to adapt to people. Um, people are different and you, I think it's your responsibility to make sure that you can communicate efficiently. Um, you know, it's a two way street as well, but I think it's, it's really as a, minority manager, I wanted to make sure that I was able to communicate with all different types of people and I did extra training and reached out to people to make sure that I was equipped for doing that. Whereas I don't think you necessarily see that from other type of managers. Um, but I wanted to make sure that was something that I was I was very inclusive in doing and so and I think it actually paid off. People have actually told me, you know, I really appreciate um, what you do and how you handle situations. Um, you know, definitely you're putting forth effort as you know, some other people may not necessarily do that. So, so you had a lot of su early success, and obviously Amazon took note and acquired you. Can you talk about the decision process of whether or not to sort of stay the course, join forces with Amazon, and uh, all the other decisions that were sort of thought through during that process? Right. So, uh, 
that was not an easy process at all. Um, you know, we, we came, I was actually presenting at a, a conference in Boston uh, for the rework conference, it's a deep learning conference for startups. And uh, I was on stage talking about Park Pick, talking about the technology. Uh, when I came off stage, a guy approached me, he was from Amazon, he said, hey, we're really interested in what you're doing. Um, you know, can I get your card? And so I gave him my card, I didn't think he was gonna call me, you know, uh, these, these sort of things happen, I don't know, I didn't expect it, but it's sure enough he did. Uh, so it was a long legal vetting process, um, back and forth. Amazon, of course, you know, they're huge, they're giants, they're, they don't play games. Uh, so they wanna make sure that, you know, everything that we were saying was true. Uh, so it was a long back and forth, like months and months. Uh, and then there was also the negotiation uh, step, and I can't say too much about that, but I will say that it was a very emotional period for you know the team, uh, the stakeholders involved. Um, you know, we all came to the table. We had some really, really heated discussions. Uh, we say, okay, on one hand, um, we're about to enter another series of funding. Um, will we end up losing the majority of the company anyway? Um, will the rest of the team be in a much better position? Uh, after acquisition than they were before. Can we guarantee that we stay in Atlanta, Georgia because we don't wanna move to California because it's much higher uh, living costs, uh, you know, or Seattle. And so all of these were things that, you know, we went back and forward on, uh, you know, it's business, people's feelings were hurt, uh, you know, but we, we had to try our best to get what we thought we deserved. And so uh, it was just a long emotional process, but eventually I think we, we have no regrets. I think, um, you know, we decided those investors who took a chance on us, we were actually able to pay them back and they had some profit from that. So hopefully in the future, they're able to also invest in other minority startups, um, black tech startups as well, so. So fa now fast forward, how many of your employees came, stayed on through, through the acquisition? So as majority of the employees did, um, we were at about 12 people when we got, we were getting ready to get acquired and 10 of, 10 of them came over. Amazing. So we're, 10 of us are in Atlanta now. We wanted to make sure that everyone was taken care of. That yeah. was another big thing we wanted to you know, be, be certain yeah. about. Well, that's a huge testament to the pro process. Um, so now what, what, par what factor did culture play into that and how have you been able to maintain your culture post, post the acquisition? So it's, it's interesting that they say Amazon is the largest uh, startup, uh, largest startup corporation. Um, and and it's, it's very, I guess you could say decentralized. You have teams over here doing something. Maybe there's some teams over here doing the exact same thing. Uh, they may or may not talk to each other, you know, but one of them is gonna figure it out and they're gonna try to beat everybody else to the market. And so that's just how Amazon is, is Definitely different than, uh, and I, I've worked at IBM before, I've worked at GE. Um, very different than those type of companies, and I think uh, that's actually worked well for Amazon, obviously. Um, but it can be a little confusing at times and a little bit in disarray. However, uh, I think because of us, our special situation, we, we actually report to a team located in Palo Alto, California, but you know, we're able to stay in Atlanta, which they, they kind of put us in a, a AWS sales office. So we're like the only engineering team in there, but we still kind of have our own close knit uh, culture because we're not really integrated with the Seattle or the Palo Alto teams. Even though we do work with them, we travel a lot. But um, so we, we still are able to kind of, you know, we get free snacks and stuff like that, you know, yeah. So as you're building your business, what was the best advice you've received? Hmm. I, I think the best advice would be um, to continue continue the course. I think a lot of people thought that, uh, you know, oh, well, you know, if you can't figure it out, uh, you maybe should take a different route, you know. Um, I'm thinking, you know, some people were thinking, oh, why don't you put a human in the loop instead of trying to recognize the penny in the part, just put a human in, in the loop using a, like MTurk, where you actually have somebody on the back end saying, oh, I know what this is, and they type it and they send it back, you know, but you kind of have to believe in yourself. Um, you know, me being, a, you know, graduated from Georgia Tech, that being my area of expertise, I have journal publications, um, I worked at several places before, and just kind of believing in myself and making sure that I knew that we could get there, regardless of what anybody else thought, and just being able to convince people of that. So, and, and overall, so what, 
there, uh, people get lots of advice. People like to give, particularly early stage entrepreneurs, lots of advice. What was some of the worst advice you got? Hmm. <laughs> so, uh, well, move into Silicon Valley to, to live yeah. in a co-working space. <laughs> that was like, what? <laughs> Living out of our car. Like someone actually suggested that, you know, yo, you don't have to worry about cost of living, you just live out of your car. That sounds like a great strategy. Yeah, like, what? <laughs> no, I, you know, so. Sleep under your desk. Yeah, I think that was terrible advice. So we didn't follow that, but yeah. And do you have um, any advice for other underrepresented groups in their sort of journey of building a business and raising capital? Yeah, I definitely think, uh, and I always say this, like it really boils down to your team. I don't think one person can do it all. Um, there's a lot of you know, people, especially like me being a tech person, you may come up with an idea, um, but you're, you're a tech person, usually you're not thinking about it from other angles, like the customer experience. Um, so it really takes someone to kind of be over that portion. And then we needed someone, uh, you know, to raise money. That was a full-time job. Um, Jewel, uh, our CEO, she was hit the pavement, hit, she was on the plane uh, at least once a week, visiting someone, meeting with someone, um, working on pitch, de pitch decks. That was definitely something that, you know, you need someone who devoted only to that, I believe. Um, and then, of course, uh, the tech side, the CTO, I had a specialty in this particular area. Um, we also, we looked at other people such as, um, you know, just software developers in general, but this was a, machine learning is a very specific area. And so you need someone who really knows what they're doing. Um, and it's not easy, easy to necessarily contract out. So you want that person to kind of be in-house for all your specialty expertise type of technical areas. Um, <clears throat> everything else, of course, you know, probably ended up contracting out like web development or full stack development. But I think it's very important to have a well diverse team that meshes well together. So uh, you don't want to, you know, have arguments every day that end up in going in circles. You want to make sure you have people on your team who you can mesh well with. Uh, so one last question. You hear a lot about uh, mentorship and sponsorship and building your own personal board of directors. How, how did you sort of go through this process? Did you have mentors? Did you seek out mentors? How do you how do you get sort of it, sort of higher level advice? Yeah. So uh, good question. I think we all had mentors. So we had an advisory board, of course. Uh, we had people who were you know very heavily you know, immersed in the business side. Uh, and we also had technical advisors. We had professors from Georgia Tech, um, professors from Stanford on our board that we could kind of rely on and reach out to. Uh, you know, personally, um, you know, we had financial advisors you know, say, would say, okay, help us with our evaluation. How do we, um, you know, we had a legal team to help us with uh, you know, things like NDA. And so I think it, it takes a will also a well-diverse set of advisors to help you um, build a company and build it successfully. So I think we'll stop there. Thank you, Nashley. Can we, op we have a few minutes to open it up to a few questions. Does anyone have any questions? I, don't, I guess there's a mic coming. There's a mic coming. Thank you. Um, so, uh, so my question is in terms of um, inclusion and diversity, so do you go out of the way to find the diversity, even lower your bar, you see what I'm saying, right? Or you just be blind and then just based on merits, it doesn't matter the race or gender or anything. So which way do you think it's a better idea for a company? So in hindsight, do never lower the bar. Um, in fact, at Amazon, we have this saying called, uh, you know, continue a bar raiser. In, in other words, everyone you hire in your team should be better than everybody else on the team. So you're constantly getting better and better. And so I said I've made a lot of mistakes hiring. I've, I've actually lowered the bar before, and I fired that person. I, learned, I, had, I paid a, a heavy cost on that. So I would say never lower the bar. You just have to really f be adamant about finding the people. It really boils down to how soon do you need to hire um, if you're really trying to look for a particular, you know, if, you, if inclusion is one of your goals, um, you want to make sure that you're timing it correctly as well. So the follow-up question is, do you have any hard data that, yeah, uh, that, helps, that helps increase productivity? I, 
I probably could. I can't quote it off the top of my head, though. But I do know that um, just as Amazon alone, I've noticed that the minority managers or the female managers, um, they have better team ratings, like better manager ratings than people with uh, you know non-diverse teams, so to speak. Um, I think it's a better. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think that as a minority uh, manager, you you have inclusion in mind every day because you know it's a part of you, whereas someone else may not. And so you know it, it may not be something that they're thinking about, but um, and they may never even notice or experience the difference. Um, you know, we have a lot of people who still question: Is inclusion necessary? Is it needed? I have debates about this every day with people, you know, at lunch. So even on my team, right? And so it's it's amazing. I think you know we're still at a point where not everyone is a believer, um, but I definitely think the the minority managers are. So. Um, so thank you both for your insights. Um, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is there's a, a VC firm called Human Ventures that's doing a DNI initiative in the VC space, and I was just curious as to what your thoughts are. The initiative is called NYC Blend. And then the second question that I have is on, um, you know, when you're hiring people, right, you have these biases that a lot of times you're not aware of. How do you force yourself to confront it? Because it's really hard to fight things that you're not even conscious of. True. Uh, so the first question, I couldn't hardly hear you about the, the VC, um, but I, I can answer the second one, but if you want to okay. repeat the first Sh one. Sure. The first question, so the, there's a VC firm, Human Ventures. Uh, they have a DNI initiative in the VC space called New York City Blend. I was just curious as to your insights or thoughts on that, on that initiative. Oh, hmm. I don't think I'm familiar with it. Uh, and I'm not, I, I know Human Ventures, but I don't know New York Blend. I mean, which one, what are they doing? It's a, it's a, they do an event once a month to like get, uh, to bring DNI into the VC space. So it's basically like a think tank for DNI in the VC space. That's what they run. So if neither of you have heard of it, uh, disregard the first question. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. I knew, I actually didn't know what it was called. Actually. So um, it sounds I can, like a great idea. Yeah. I mean, I think, look, <laughs> like in the last uh, 18 months, we've seen more conversation about DNI and just women generally. I think. I look, like the numbers haven't started to change yet, but what, what the great part about this is that there is a conversation about it. And I'd say, you know, what we are seeing in the marketplace is, you know, I see more and more founders apologize for their team pages. And so um, thinking more about um, who they want to take capital from. So the, whether or not it's a team with a woman or a team with some diversity in it. And so, and you're starting to see those numbers move. So every, it feels like every week right now we're seeing someone in an un, underrepresented re, uh, group being hired in one of these major firms. So slow, but um, all, all positive. So I can I just touch on your second question um, really, really fast. I think uh, you said, how do you basically help with inclusion if someone's not even aware that that's an issue? And so I think. Uh, actually, we had a, a diversity panel at Amazon recently discussing this, and it, and it basically talks about the burden is not on the minority, which oftentimes it is placed on the minority. I think what they were trying to com convey is that it's really it has to be a team effort, and so we can't say, okay, you're uh, you know there are biases, implicit biases, and microaggressions against me. You have to stop that. It's up to me to let you know about those biases, and it's up to you to help me, help you um, overcome. You know, making me feel a certain type of way. So yeah, and also from a team perspective, making it that it's an environment where you can and feel comfortable coming forward to point out those biases because they happen all of the time. Hi, so for female technical founders, um, how did you, how were you able to sort of maintain a robust pipeline? Because I feel like right now, because there is all of this conversation around being super selective, around insisting on diversity across, you know, gender ethnic spectrum, there's now this talent suck from the top where all of them are running around going, oh my God, we're 500 white men and we're all blonde hair and blue eyed and now we will go and we will, you know, give absurd paychecks to, you know, women coming out of all the technical graduate programs, I feel like on the early stage startup side, if I were to blind hire my, my engineers, 100% of them would have been men. 
just because I, I do think there's also, you know, I'd love to hear how you managed to coax women engineers to take that jump first, because I felt more pushback from women. And then how did you keep your pipeline open? So it's interesting. So I'm actually still looking for, uh, you know, top, uh, you know, I'm actually still looking for a female engineer to join my team. <laughs> it's been a, a three, almost five years now. <laughs> so, um, but I think, you know, with the startup, you can only hire, you know, we only have so much funding. And the timing was a big thing with, with startups as well. You have to, you have to beat, it, being a tech startup with a research-based uh, component, you want to be the first to the finish line because someone else can easily come up, have a bigger team, more money, and figure out the solution faster than you can. And so it was more so a timing thing with the startup. But now that we're at Amazon, we have a little bit more flexibility. Um, however, I do think it's not going to work for a team of, like you said, the blonde-haired, blue-eyed guys to certainly just start hiring people. Hiring may not be the issue. It's what you do when they get there. So how do you maintain, how do you foster relationships? How do you mentor them? How do you make them feel included? And I think that takes some sort of, uh, sort of training. Um, right now at Amazon, we're going through um, you know, transgender training. Like how do we approach the situation? How do we um, you know, uh, call certain people you know, the pronouns and learning about that? That takes training and that's effort that uh, the manager has to go through to learn these things. And it's, I think it's the same way with bringing in women or bringing in uh, minorities into the, um, the picture. Um, so I have a question about uh, specifically early stage startups approach to inclusion versus uh, later stage ones. A lot of the talk we see in um, for larger companies that they can afford to have head, uh, chief diversity officers, they can afford to have a lot of ERGs and you know, obviously when, when you have a real commitment to change it requires resources there. But resources are something that a lot of early stage startups don't necessarily have. So I'm really curious for like what are the, uh, some advice you've given to your portfolio companies or other startups that are um, you know, part of AWS program, what can they do with limited resources that can have a tangible effect on, on d &I? Yeah, I mean, I, so you bring up a very good point. So when you're a couple people in a startup and you have like all this, everything stacked against you, you're trying to build something out of nothing, also thinking about DNI is something that's really hard, right? You're just you're kind of fighting for survival. So what we tell our companies that and uh, the companies that come through are like, look, like we get it, we understand. But as you're thinking about those next hires, whether it's the fifth hire, twentieth hire, or fiftieth hire, the earlier you can get some of that diversity in your in your business, the easier it is to maintain that. So if you are all of a sudden wake up and you're fifty people and you're all look and act the same and you're all from the same schools, it's very difficult to change that. Because now, you know, if I'm, you know, if I look different and have a different background and I come in, I'm automatically gonna feel uncomfortable coming into that organization. So I'd say, you know, at the, you know, sub 10, harder, but if you can get even one person in the door and open up those searches, because usually you're like, okay, we're gonna network search, we're gonna call every single person we know, and then we're gonna come in, you might need to like post that job somewhere and do a little bit more interviewing. And ultimately, it should turn out that you're gonna get better candidates in the door because you're now screening, have a, a broader screen. But it's, um, yeah, it's, it's always a challenge, particularly in the earliest stages. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, there are also, I can't like, think of anything to come to mind, but I think there are consulting firms out there that can handle some of that for you too. I know as a startup, we, we offload it as much as possible because of course we're dealing with everything. So the more you can offload, the better. Um, hi, um, I think you had mentioned something before about uh, experiences with um, certain types of people being held to a higher standard, uh, people of color perhaps. Um, I was interested to hear you said, I can talk about that later. <laughs> I was interested if you have any input or experiences on, about that. Right, so I think, uh, I, mean, I, I, I just think what I've noticed is that, you know, there can tend to be people who, and they're not even aware of it, um, they may ask one question to someone, um, they'll ask the same question to someone else, they may give the exact same answer, 
but they'll regard one as, as slightly a better answer than coming from another person. And I think it's just the way, you know, we're, we're trained a certain way. We've been, we have certain backgrounds. We all come from different places, and those events have shaped who we are today. Um, I'm not saying that that's, we, we, we can first acknowledge that there is a problem, right? And then we can talk about ways to solve it together. And so uh, I'm just saying I've noticed that. I can't say a lot more, but you know that's just something that I think we need to work on as a as a company. Yeah. Well, we see this all the time, whether it's senior hires or board or you know additional board members. And naturally, if if people were all getting asked the same question, that would be amazing. I think one one thing that we see is you know particularly in board searches, is like hey, we have this open board search, and like one guy would be like you know oh I have the best guy. He's gonna come on, and like the other guy would say, you know, the other guy on the board would be like, yeah, you know, I just had drinks with him last week. He's fantastic. And then someone would mention a woman, and they're like, oh, what if her? What is her qualifications? And so, you know, making sure that every single person going through the process it has the same sort of lens and scrutiny is something that we all need to make sure is happening, not only at the board level or the senior exec level, but even in our entry level. Yeah, and I think uh, even beyond the hiring phase, even, again, we have to think about when you get the people there, what are you gonna do with them to improve these, uh, you know, these type of situations? And so I'm pretty sure, you know, we've all been in a situation where, you know, you may have had an idea as, as a female, but it wasn't acknowledged. But uh, another person has that same idea, and it's, oh, it's a great idea, you know? <laughs> and I've, I've had that happen, I don't know how many times. Not at Amazon, of course, we don't have those problems. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, I mean, it is a, a real issue that I think a lot of us can relate to, so. Are we all set? All right, yeah, I think yeah. that's it, yeah. Please, round of applause, thank you thank very you. much. <laughs> We are going to take a quick 15 minute break. Uh, there's ice cream, snacks, drinks, and more upstairs. So grab something, meet someone new, and we will see you back here shortly.